Hey church, welcome to episode 8 of our summer series in the book of Romans entitled Romanas. And the title of the sermon today is The War on the Inside. And I want to share a story that I think illustrates the Christian life for many of us and how many people live out the Christian life. So I want you to imagine a man who uh, recently bought a home in a neighborhood. He's a fairly new homeowner, and he starts to hear about some of the break-ins that had happened in the neighborhood. And he goes to his house, he looks around his house, and he thinks to himself, my house is unprotected. I feel vulnerable when I'm away for vacation or traveling for work. I need to protect my house. I don't want anything stolen or messed with. And so he calls a security company to come out and to install a state-of-the-art security system in his brand new home. He wants the keypad with the sensors on the doors and windows. He wants cameras. He wants it all. And so they're scheduled to come. However, he knows that the day that they're coming, that morning, he's stuck in a meeting at work, and he can't get home to let them in. And he doesn't want to wait any longer. And so what does he do? He calls his neighbor, who he's gotten to know and feels comfortable with, and he invites his neighbor to go over to his house and to let the alarm company in. He has one of those keypads on the door where you can type it in and unlock the door. So he gives the code to the neighbor and the neighbor lets the security company in. Now the security company has no idea that this neighbor is not the owner. This neighbor let him in. They assume he's the owner. So they got set up the security system. They put all the sensors up. They put all the cameras up. They put the keypad in, and they're training him, and he's walking with them to see where everything is and how it's laid out, and they give him the code and how everything should operate. They leave. The neighbor leaves, and he shares the code that was implemented to the owner of the house, and all of the materials necessary are left there on the counter. And so the man comes home from work, and he feels safe. He now has a state-of-the-art alarm, He's not going to have anything stolen. Doesn't matter what kind of reports he hears in the neighborhood. He's good. But over the next few months, there are some things that have been missing. They've gone missing from his house. And he begins to realize that he's actually been robbed a few times. Now, he checks the footage on the camera, and he doesn't see anything. He actually has no idea how this is happening because the alarm has never been triggered. The cops have never been alerted. He calls the alarm company. He starts to complain that their alarm system doesn't work because he's been robbed several times and he's shown nothing. So he thinks about what to do. See, what he doesn't know is that the neighbor, when he was there letting in the security company, as he followed them around and installing everything, he learned everything. He learned where the blind spots are for the camera. He knew the code. And he had been going over when his neighbor was gone at work, had been taking things and stealing things and wreaking havoc in his home. And it was never caught. He knew the code. He knew how to avoid the cameras. But see, the man is freaking out. He has no idea what to do. He feels unprotected. He's vulnerable. And so what does he do? He calls another alarm company and he says, I I want you to come in because I was with another one. It didn't work. So come in, take this one out and put in a brand new system. And this time he's like, I'm going to be there. I'm taking off work for the day. I want to see that everything is installed right. I want to know how everything works. So they do that and he feels safe. I'm there. Nobody else knows the code. Nobody knows anything. But guess what? He keeps getting robbed. He has no idea how. He cannot see anything on the cameras. He's vulnerable, unprotected. He's tried multiple alarm companies by this point. But what he doesn't know is that the neighbor that was coming over and robbing him before he got the new alarm company, he also installed security spy cameras of his own so he could see if he ever changed the company to a new one where all the blind spots were for the cameras installed and also what the code was. You see, it doesn't matter how many times that guy continues to change alarm companies and put in new systems, he will continue to be robbed because his approach is wrong. He's got to do a deep dive. 
What he needs to do is stop and say, I'm going to look through this entire house. He needs to discover the spy cameras, possibly put in some of his own cameras that are separate from the alarm so that he can catch who the culprit is. He needs to probably go get a vicious guard dog that stays in the house at all times. He needs to then go address his neighbor and call him to account for all that he has done. He needs an entirely different approach. And I think many of us in our Christian life, we are like this man that bought the home and wanted to protect himself. He felt vulnerable. And so we set up these security systems in our lives. We put up these defensive measures. We have all this protective things as buffers because we know that there's a war on the inside, conflicting desires between who we are called to be and who we are made in the image of God in Christ We are made righteous, we are called to a new life, and yet sin is constantly trying to get in. So we put up these security systems, but we fail to recognize that sin has a spy camera on our heart. It knows how to get in. It knows how to avoid detection. And we need to change our approach. If we keep trying just to put up new security systems as protective measures, It will continue to fail us. We need an entirely different approach to deal with the battle of sin, the war on the inside of the conflicting desires that we have. And that's what the Apostle Paul is going to speak about here in chapter 7 and chapter 8. We're going to look at the latter half of chapter 7 and the beginning section of Romans chapter 8. So if you have your Bible at home, will you turn turn to Romans chapter 7? Uh, We're going to be starting in verse 15, and if you don't have a Bible at home, you can always read it on the screen below. Let's read the first five verses or so, starting in verse, verse 15. The Apostle Paul says this, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do What I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. Now when you read this at first glance, you may be tempted to think that the Apostle Paul is talking about what it was like before he came to faith in Christ. But I want to argue that he is speaking about his current experience. Scholars at times will disagree on the the place in which the Apostle Paul is thinking about, the place of his life when he writes this. Was it before he came to faith in Christ, or is it his current Christian experience, even as he pens these words to the church in Rome? I agree with many scholars that say that it's his current Christian experience for a few reasons. One, in Romans chapter 7, for the first 14 verses, he's using the past tense. And then here in verse, I think, 14 or 15, he changes tense to the present tense. Here he's speaking in the present tense. And he's speaking about an ongoing struggle. Not one that is done and over with and no longer true, but one that seems to be current. In fact, the very discussion that he is having or or the honesty that he's sharing his internal struggle reveals that he has in fact come to faith in Christ. See, he's saying that he knows what he's supposed to do. He knows what he desires to do. Deep down, he wants to honor God. He wants to follow his ways. He wants to do what is right, but he keeps doing the opposite. The very fact that he recognizes that conflict is a marker that he, has, he is in Christ. 
that he's received the grace of God and he has been made righteous, called to walk in a new life. And now he feels the tension, the struggle of knowing what he should do and doing the opposite. You see, this is such good news for us. It's encouraging news. Why? The Apostle Paul is someone that we as the church honor and respect and look up to. And we should. But it's encouraging because he struggled deeply with sin. He had a war on the inside of his heart that he was battling time and time again. He's just like us. Is that encouraging? It should be. You see, you never get so advanced in your faith or so mature as a Christian to the point where you are over sin or you no longer deal with that war on the inside. You never reach that place. The Apostle Paul certainly didn't. He speaks here about that internal struggle. You see, it's actually quite the opposite. The more mature you are in Christ, the more you are aware of how broken you are. The more holy you become, the less holy you feel. The more holy you become, the less holy you feel. You Sometimes we think to ourselves, does anyone else struggle with these things? We look at our life, the things that we battle, the temptations that we fall into, and we think, do other people feel like this? And then we have this propensity to look at Christian leaders or pastors or people that we respect in the faith, and we think, there's no way they struggle with something like this. There's no way that they're really battling sin. Sure, yes, they're sinful, so they probably drive too fast sometimes, but it's probably on the way to a prayer meeting, so it's kind of not that bad. No, see, the encouraging news of Romans chapter 7, verse 15 through 20, is that the Apostle Paul deeply struggled with sin. He had a war on the inside, just like you, and just like the person preaching to you. We all battle sin. We all struggle. We are all tempted. We are all conflicted. You see, the reality of sin is that it has two layers. There's two layers to sin, kind of like an iceberg. There's the surface level, and then there's what's deep down. The surface level sins are things like lust, and greed, and slander, and lying, and judgment, fostering hostility, gossip, etc., These are the surface level sins. We see them, we recognize them, we experience them, we fall into them. But then there is a deep sin beneath all surface level sins that actually fuels them, and that deep sin is to be like God. That is the deep sin within all of us. It actually traces all the way back to the garden. Adam and Eve are in the garden, and they are tempted to take from the tree that is forbidden. Now, the reason that they're tempted to take from the tree is not because they look at the apple or the fruit and they think, well, I wonder if it tastes good. I'm really hungry. I didn't really eat today. I wonder if it's better than what I've had. It had nothing to do with hunger. had nothing to do with taste. The temptation was that it was forbidden. It was forbidden. And so the thought was, well, what am I missing? Will it make me wise like God? Will it improve my life? It's a desire to be like God. That is the deep sin that fuels all of those surface level sins. You see, we ignore God's rules because we want to make the rules. We want to chart our own course. We want to decide what's good and what's evil. We want to be like God. It's the deep level of sin. The very fact that it's forbidden 
is what makes us want to taste it and try it. And this creates in us this conflict within us, this internal conflict. We talked about last week how we are dead to sin. In Christ, you are dead to sin, meaning it no longer controls you. It no longer reigns over you. You are dead to sin, and you are alive to God, called to walk in a new life. And yet, you feel just like the Apostle Paul. I feel just like the Apostle Paul, where I think, I want to walk in that new life. I want to live alive to God. And yet, the very thing I want to do, I do the exact opposite. I know what I should do. I know what is right. And I do the opposite. Haven't you been there before where you think to yourself, why did I do that? I'm so dumb. Why did I do that? Why did I act like that? There are times, I'm sure, where you are in the middle of, you know, struggling in a conversation or there's a a temptation before you. And you think in your head, I know what I should do. I know what the right thing is to do. I should say this, or I should respond like that, or I should go there. But then you do the exact opposite of what you know you should do. See, that is who we are. That is how we respond so often. Look what he says, the Apostle Paul, in verse 18, the second half of verse 18. I, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Isn't that true? Sometimes you think to yourself, especially around those things that are, real, there's a real conflict of desire. You know what you want to do, but you feel like you don't even have the ability to carry it out. In verse 21, he says this, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. (laughs) Isn't that so true? You know what you're supposed to do. You know what is right. And it feels like evil is right next to you. That temptation is right there. Every time you want to do what is right, There's something pulling you in the opposite direction. There's this war on the inside. So the Apostle Paul continues to flesh this out in verse 22 through 24. He says this, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive through the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So the Apostle Paul here uses the word law several times in this short section. And he uses it in two different ways. First, he speaks about law as in the law of God, the word of God, scripture. That's what he says in verse 22. Let's look at that verse again. For I delight in the law of God, in God's word, in scripture, in my inner being. So deep down, because I have been renewed, I have been transformed by the power of the gospel, I have been made righteous, I am alive to God, dead to sin, in my inner being, I want to follow the law of God, scripture. I want to delight in that. I do, deep down. But I see in my members another law. Now, he's not speaking in verse 23 about another scripture. He's speaking about a force or another power. He's using the word law, which actually there means power. So look at verse 23 again and change out the word law with power. But I see in my members another power waging war against the power of my mind and making me captive to the power of sin that dwells in my members. Deep down in my inner being, I delight in the law of God. I have been transformed. I have been made new. I am dead to sin. I am alive to God. 
in my inner being. But there's another power that pulls and, and is conflicted with the power of my mind, and that is the power of sin. And what he comes to recognize and to declare as he analyzes his heart and his life and how he responds is verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You see, true maturity of faith leads to an awareness of your present or current and original condition. True maturity of faith leads to an awareness of your current and original condition. It is to be aware that you are just like the Apostle Paul says he is in verse 24. Wretched. That's pretty strong. You're wretched. When you really look at yourself and the conflicting desires within you, deep down you delight in the law of God and you want to walk and follow his ways, but when you know there are times you want to do what is right and you do the opposite, there's another power that is pulling at you and causing this war on the inside. It's kind of like this, this uh, meme or picture I saw on the internet of this apple. You can see it now. The apple looks in the mirror. The reflection is great. But when you look behind the apple, you see that it's been eaten up. You see, we love to project ourselves like the apple. We don't want to say that we're wretched. We don't want anyone to see that we are, in fact, wretched and broken. And so we work really hard to make ourselves look good, to make ourselves seem better than we really are. This is the, I I believe that this is really the motivation for creating filters for your phone camera. So you can make something look better. This is why we can crop photos to make it look better. This is why you take 20 pictures to get one good one so that it looks better. This is the constant rat race that so many of us are running to keep looking good, to keep presenting ourselves as attractive, to keep presenting ourselves as successful and growing. We want to look better than we know we are when we really analyze our heart and our life. You see, here's the truth. The truth is this, and we don't really want to admit it, but Scripture calls us to. And that is, if you were to look at the description in the bio of our life, if you were to hashtag no filter your life and my life, here's what it would say. Wretched. It would say wretched. We would have to turn the apple around and reveal who we really are. But you see, when you take the mask off and when you own that conflict within you and how you constantly are failing and how you are in fact wretched and broken, there is great liberation there. That's why the Apostle Paul says this in the next verse. He says, what a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of sin? Verse 25, the next verse, he says this. Thanks be to God. Who's going to deliver him? He turns the attention to one person. It's God himself. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. You see, you may be wretched, I may be wretched, but God is not. Who can deliver you? What hope do you have? You have a great hope. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Though you want to serve and follow God's law with your mind, as he said, in your flesh, there is so much temptation that is leading you to do the exact opposite that you want to do in your inner being. You're wretched, but God is not. Sometimes I think we 
struggle with this reality. And so we think to ourselves, how could I possibly be loved by God? How could I possibly be accepted by God? When I do these things, when I've done these things, when I continue, continually struggle with this, there's no way that God could continue to love me and accept me. There's no way. I'm too wretched. Can lead you to think, maybe I'm not a Christian. Because Christians wouldn't struggle with this. You see, the very fact that you identify that conflict, that you feel that conflict, that you are aware of the the truth that you don't always do the very thing you know you should do, that your inner being that you delight in is telling you to do this and you do the opposite, the very awareness that you are in fact wretched reveals the work of salvation in you. It reveals that you should respond when you feel that way. Thanks be to God. It's not up to me to clean myself up to make myself look better. It's because of God and what he has done. The very fact that you ask yourself those questions and you feel that way reveals that salvation is working within you. You see, everybody has conflicting desires. Everyone does. So much of what takes place in our culture, especially in your teenage years and early 20s, is this journey to discover yourself. And what that really means is sorting out the conflicting desires that you have and trying to determine which desires feel most right for you and then identifying with those desires and following them. That really comes back to the the deep-seated nature of our sin and who we are, which is to play God, to decide which which desires we want for ourselves, to discover who we are, because we feel the conflict, and then chart our course once we've resolved that. You see, Christians feel that too. We feel the conflict within our heart. But here's the difference. Though we are conflicted, we have the war on the inside, we know which desires are true of us. We know which desires we are to identify with. And that is what is in our inner being. The Word of God. The promises of God. The truth of God. How God speaks to you and to me about who we truly are. That is who we are. And so as we consider that, the the important question to ask and really the natural question to ask next is, okay, well, if that's who I am, then how in the world do I fight that war on the inside? I mean, what hope do I have to really grow in Christ? To walk in that new life that I struggle to walk in. How do I do that? What hope do I have? Do I need to just start this week by trying harder? And maybe putting up some extra buffers in my life and some more protective measures? No. Because no matter how many times you change out the security system, Sin has the camera on your heart. It's going to know how to get back in. You don't live under law. You live under grace. So here's the answer. Here's how you fight sin. Here's how you battle those conflicting desires in your heart. Here's how you seek to walk in that new life. The answer is is that you seek to follow God's law by living under grace. You seek to follow God's law, His word, by living under grace. Now, I understand that that's that's not all that clear. That sounds like church language. I seek to follow God's law by living under grace, but you don't really know what that means. The Apostle Paul wants to help us understand exactly what that means. That's why he says this in verse 1 of chapter 8, the very next chapter. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You may be conflicted. You may not do the thing that you want to do. In fact, you do the exact opposite. You know what your inner being is telling you to follow after, and yet you are listening to something totally 
different. You identify as wretched when you really analyze your life. But what does the gospel of grace tell you? When you live under grace, you know there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You are wretched, yes, but what is your position in Christ? Not condemned. Condemnation no longer exists for you. God has nothing against you at all, period. You see, you are a situational sinner, but a positional saint. You are situationally wretched. Yes, so am I. But you are positionally holy. You are a situational sinner, but a positional saint. You see, it's important too that you understand this. It's not only that you're situationally a sinner and you're wretched, but you're positionally in Christ a saint and holy. It's not only that that is true of you presently, as if, okay, everything in the past has been forgiven, and and right now I'm forgiven, but there is something I can do in the future to mess it all up. Some type of mortal sin or some type of grave mistake that there's no coming back from. That condemnation will be over me again. Like right now, condemnation is suspended, but maybe not forever. No. <laughs> you are positionally a saint eternally, not presently. It's not just that you are presently a positional saint. You are eternally a positional saint. Condemnation is gone forever in Christ. Forever. That is what living under grace means, is recognizing that. That you don't have to prove yourself to God and others. In fact, even in the midst of your struggle, you can go to God in prayer with confidence. You can come to worship God with joy even when you had a rough week. You are not condemned in Christ at all. God has nothing against you. What freedom there is in that. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul wants to say, is that when you're living under grace, there is such freedom to live different. Verse 2 through 6, he says this, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the minds on the flesh is death, but to set the minds on the Spirit is life and peace." see, he says here that God has done what you could never do. You could never uphold the law. I could never uphold the law. We are too wretched. But Christ has. Christ condemned sin on the cross. So you can know you are no longer condemned. God has nothing against you when you are in Christ. And then he says this. Here's what's important to understand. You were previously setting your mind on sin. And it is a temptation to constantly be setting our minds on sin. But now you are free to set your mind on things above. To set your mind on Christ. To set your mind on Him. This is how you can walk. You are wretched, yes, but you are positionally a saint. Not condemned. God has nothing against you. And so you can freely set your mind, not on sin, as you used to walk formerly, but on that new life and on Christ and on the things above. William Temple, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 20th century, has this great quote. He says, your religion is what you do with your solitude. Your religion is what you do with your solitude. You see, whatever your mind thinks about when you're not distracted is what you're living for. 
Whatever your mind thinks about when you're not distracted is what you are living for. Because what you set your mind on affects your character, your actions, your lifestyle. What preoccupies your mind pilots your life. Whatever preoccupies your mind pilots your life. And so if you want to grow in Christ, if you want to battle the sin and the temptations within you and fight that war on the inside, you need to set your mind on Christ. Set your mind on things above and on Christ himself. So what does that mean? It means that you need to learn to meditate and to think deeply upon the good news of the gospel, on who God is and what he's done for you. As the Apostle Paul says here, to think about what Christ has accomplished for you, that you're not condemned because sin was condemned on the cross. You need to set your mind on Christ. You are pulling up what is in your inner being, that delight in the word of God the law of God, you're pulling it up from the deep. It's flooding your mind so that you can then battle those surface sins because you're addressing the deep sin, which is to be like God. That deep sin to be like God is crucified by the truth of the gospel and the truth of the cross and what Christ has done for you. And as that comes up from the deep into your mind, it enables you to actually fight those surface sins that you struggle with. You see, if the gospel preoccupies your mind, if the gospel preoccupies your mind, then, then you can live according to its truth. If the gospel preoccupies your mind, then its truth will pilot your life. It will pilot your life. That's why Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That means Jesus is the way to the Father, as he says. The only way to the Father. But he's also the way to spiritual growth. He is the way to fight sin. He is the way to healing. He is the way. There are not other ways. The truth and the life. How do you fight sin? Through Jesus. In Christ, he's condemned sin for you. It's reflecting upon the good news of grace. You see, you do not fight the sin and the war on the inside by seeking to obey God out of fear or out of duty. No, that's a flash in the pan. You obey God out of joy. Your motivation is love and gratitude because of what God has done for you because you have sought to consider the wonder of the gospel and you are free, not condemned, to consider deeply and to meditate deeply on who God is so that you can walk in that new life that you want to walk in through the power of the gospel in you. And you can have hope. Sometimes we, we, we lose hope like, I, I'm never going to change, God. I've been struggling for so long. No, you can have hope. Why? Look at verse 9 through 11 to close. It says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The Apostle Paul says, listen, you can have hope for change. You can have hope to grow. You can have hope to begin to see some of those battles and the desires in your heart that are conflicting. You can see yourself win those. Why? Because you have the spirit within you. The same spirit that brought Christ back from the dead dwells in you, has taken residence within you. It's your guard dog. Why would you doubt that you could change? Why would you consider that you'll never heal? Why would you think, I'm never going to be able to say no to this sin? No, you have the spirit within you, the same spirit. There is hope for change and growth. So, church, my prayer for you 
is that you would understand the way that you fight the war on the inside is not by just going to get a new security system, putting up new protective measures. You see, accountability measures and behavioral change, mentorship, all of these things are helpful, but they're only helpful if your first approach and your initial approach is to dive deep and to develop a solid foundation of the gospel. That is not, it goes from your inner being up to your mind. It is what you think about. It is what you do with your solitude is to spend time meditating on who God is and what he has done. That's how you fight sin. That's how you battle the war on the inside because what preoccupies your mind pilots your life. So church, let it be the gospel. Will you pray with me? God, we just thank you so much that in Christ we are not condemned. Lord, we give you our life. We surrender our life to you. Spirit, heal us. Purify our hearts. Begin to bring up that inner desire for the law of God that we delight in to our minds so that we can combat the power and the force of sin that wants to pull us in the opposite direction. Would we as your people meditate deeply on who you are, God, and what you have done? Because that is our approach to battle in the war on the inside. Give us hope because, Spirit, we know you dwell within us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.